Good evening. Tonight is Monday, October 10th, 2022, and this is the Committee of the Whole for the City of Gahanna. I'd like to welcome all of our guests tonight, and uh, seeing as we have another full room, I uh, just wanted to go over a little bit about uh, Committee of the Whole. Tonight is an opportunity for uh, council to engage in discussion with um, the administration and other members who, uh, of the public who may have business pending before the body. Um, we do not have an opportunity for public hearing tonight, so there is no hearing of visitors, uh, specifically at Committee of the Whole, but we will have uh, an opportunity for hearing of visitors to occur next Monday, the 17th. Um, there's always a standing hearing, uh, hearing of visitors at our regular council meetings on the first first and third Mondays at seven o'clock. Next Monday, we will also have a public hearing on the rezoning of the 5503 Morse Road site. Uh, we will take proponent and opponent testimony uh, at, on that at, at the meeting on the 17th. Um, you are also always welcome to email council, council at gahanna.gov or any of the members of the administration. Uh, and there is an, an application on the uh, city council website where uh, members of the public can submit a video comment to be viewed during public hearing, during hear excuse me, during hearing of visitors. Oh. And again, with uh, the large number of uh, guests that we have in the audience tonight, I would just ask everyone to take a moment to please check that your cell phone is on silent or on vibrate so that we don't have any disruptions uh, while other people are speaking. All right. The first item that we have on our agenda tonight uh, under discussions is a discussion um, on building inclusive communities. I'm excited to welcome tonight Amy Claben, um, who I have been talking with for a couple of years, I think almost, uh, on some different housing policy across the region. Uh, so welcome to Amy Claben, uh, the principal of Strategic Opportunities, LLC. Thank you. And uh, Lorianne Feibel, did I pronounce your last sure name did. correctly? Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Fiber, uh, Feibel is a member of the uh, City Council of uh, the City of Bexley, and they're joining us to speak on building inclusive communities. You may recognize uh, Ms. Clayman. Uh, Amy was the former director of Homeport, uh, and uh, now is also um, uh, instrumental in the Move to Prosper uh, nonprofit that we heard about last week. So with that, I'll turn it over to you for uh, the presentation. Thank you. Happy Monday, uh, good citizens of Gahanna. And um, thank you so much for welcome, welcoming me into your uh, chamber this evening. Um, thank you. Um, our good Mayor Kessler wanted to make sure that I said hello to you. I was just going to tell Mayor you the same Stadlin. thing. I, I spoke to Mayor Kessler this afternoon. He told me you were going to be here. So. Yes, he says that you share uh, his committee um, in, uh, for sustainability at Morpsey. Correct. Right. So, right. so. Thank you. Um, President, Vice President, and all of council, thank you so much for allowing me to speak in front of you tonight. Um, for the past nine years, I have been um, honored to serve a very sweet community um, that insists that their representatives create legislation that promotes inclusivity, and equality. Um, in fact, our citizens um, formed in the 1990s a community foundation that likes to brag that they work to make sure that Bexley is a wonderful place to live, work, play. And in the last year, they added on the word care. And I think it's very appropriate that Bexley did that because we show signs of that regularly. And when Bexley passed our sources of income legislation, um, we gave our fair housing laws a booster shot. Um, council reaffirmed our commitment to being a welcoming community for all and that we would continue to explore and enact policy reforms and programs to expand equality and availability of affordable housing to families who want to make Bexley their home. Like most cities in our country, like most states in our country, um, landlords are not 
are not required to accept vouchers as a source of payment for rental. Um, so this is often discriminatory against uh, potential tenants. Um, landlords are prohibited from refusing rent to members of protected classes, obviously, as in all of Ohio. But they don't have to accept vouchers. This, sadly, most affects the exact classes that we are trying to protect in our fair housing laws. It affects, affects families with children, ethnic minorities, and persons with disabilities. Did I mention families with children? All I've ever wanted for my whole life was to be a mom. I got into this gig and realized that not only could I make a difference in the lives of my own three children, but that I could mother children that I never will even meet. I always say that I legislate always wearing my mom's hat. I want for all moms to have a choice of what communities they want to live in. I want them to want to come to Bexley, and I want them to be able to come to Bexley. I want them to want to come to your sweet city of Gahanna and be able to come to your sweet city of Gahanna. We know that children who come into our cities that have great opportunities, data proves that they prosper, that they do better educationally, that they grow up and end up uh, earning a better living. What we don't realize is what the children who are already in Gahanna and Bexley, how they benefit. We don't live in a bubble. We live in, a, in, a, in communities where our children have to be able to get along with all kinds of people of all different economic backgrounds, all kinds of ethnicities. I like to say that it's one thing to be invited to the party. It's a totally different thing to be invited to dance. And we all learn wonderful new steps when we ask someone to dance. I just want to also mention that source of income is something, legislation is something that Morpsey has on their agenda. They have, they have known before Intel ever decided they wanted to come to our area that our population was going to grow by a million. We're at like 2.1. We're going to hit 3 million by the year 2050. And again, that was pre-Intel announcing their arrival. They have prioritized the idea of supporting policies that work to eliminate racial and social disparities in our growing region enacting source of income protection laws to remove barriers to housing. This is meant to open housing for people with federal housing vouchers. When I looked to uh, write this piece of legislation for the city of Bexley, Cincinnati had it already, Lindale in the Cleveland area, along with South Euclid, University Heights, Warrenville Heights, and Wycliffe. We became the seventh city in the state, we became the first city in central Ohio. And when you pass this law, you will be lucky number seven in our, in our area. So I, I urge you to join the cool kids. Please, please, I urge you to vote yes when this ordinance is brought to you next week. Thank you. You're on, Amy. <laughs> Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Council Pre uh, President and Vice President, members of Council and Mayor. 
thank you for having us tonight. So building inclusive communities, there we go, is part of Move to Prosper, but it actually includes about 20 other organizations that are supporting the need to have inclusive communities throughout our region. The purpose of this initiative is to advance understanding of the need for inclusive housing in the entire region, especially as we address inclusivity in the workplace, because we'll never get it in the workplace unless we have children growing up together and learning how to live together with um, people who are different from you economically, racially, ethnic, from an ethnic perspective in every other way. So Central Ohio has been the only region here uh, in Ohio experiencing population growth for the past several decades, <laughs> while housing production at all price levels has not kept up with demand. So building inclusive communities has been hosting conversations to create dialogue about how Central Ohio can become a region where everyone has the opportunity to decide where they would like to live, work, play, and raise their family. And I'll tell you about our next move to, um, Building Inclusive Communities program at the end. So um, why Building Inclusive Communities? So a little bit of background. How we got here. Um, I assume you've heard of redlining. And the map that's um, up on the screen is a redlining map from 1936. Redlining prevents African Americans, people of color, from obtaining loans to purchase homes. And that also impacts access to rental housing. That map, um, the light colors show where back in 1936, people could not buy um, homes. And if you've seen recent pictures, like this one, this is an opportunity map. Those are areas of concentrated poverty, the, the light areas on this map. And this shows the legacy of redlining in our community. The darker the area, the higher the opportunity. We call it higher resourced, um, access to jobs, access to higher resource schools, grocery stores, and green space. And you live in a wonderful community of Gahanna, as you know from the map, it's one of the very darker colored areas, lots of resources here. It's not just redlining, this is um, the history of exclusionary zoning and housing discrimination that has prevented people from having the opportunity to choose where they would like to live in the region. So this is why Building Inclusive <coughs> Communities has been hosting conversations about creating opportunities for people throughout the region. So the lasting impacts of segregation in housing, it's a loss of intergenerational wealth for families of color as they could not buy homes. Reduced opportunities for individuals and families as they're excluded from, from neighborhoods. It, there's actually a lot of research on the impact of the reduction in our regional GDP because of the segregation in housing. And employers are not able to fill jobs as they lack access as people lack access to where the jobs are located. And this creates concentrations of poverty, which make it very, very difficult for generations to move forward in their lives. So this is why we need solutions. Systemic solutions are needed to provide access to neighborhoods throughout the region. Adopting protection from, dis uh, from discrimination due to one source of income is the first step in a systemic solution. Source of income protection is needed as it prevents landlords from refusing to rent to people based on the type of income they use to pay their rent. Source of income discrimination oh, is when a landlord discriminates based on the type of income. And it's not just vouchers, it impacts veterans, and it impacts people with disabilities, and it impacts um, people who have uh, alimony or ch child support that help them pay their rent.
and we talked about the um, uh, vulnerable populations. So source of income discrimination perpetuates poverty and systemic racism. In, um, so Lori Ann discussed um, housing choice vouchers. Three in five housing choice voucher holders live in neighborhoods with a very high poverty rate, which makes it difficult to move up and out of poverty. There's 13,522 Franklin County uh, vouchers here in um, the region. 87% are actually in Columbus. There are 48 here in Gahanna. This is um, information that I received from the Housing Authority today. Two years ago, um, there were 57. 80% of the housing vouchers are being used by minorities, 78% non-Hispanic black. 50% are um, held by people who have a disabled head of household. So how does it work? Regardless of type of income, if you have a source of income ordinance, landlords remain, retain their right to screen and deny housing if um, people do not meet the eligibility criteria. Landlords may charge a security deposit. They accept nothing less than the market rent. And they can seek damages if the tenant violates the rental agreement. If the tenant has a housing choice voucher, the landlord then needs to uh, comply with inspections of the housing authority, it's no cost to the landlord, and complete three documents. So the impact. Rental assistance actually benefits landlords. If the tenant has a housing choice voucher, it's guaranteed rent, if, um, which means it's recession proof tenant uh, loses their job or loses hours, the amount of the rental support from the housing authority goes up and the landlord remains whole. This uh, reduces eviction impact on both the tenant and landlord, and as you know, our community is facing an eviction crisis, so having a housing choice voucher is a good protection. It mitigates the housing cost burden for tenants, thus enabling them to use their funds for other purposes, food, health care, transportation, et cetera. And it reduces discrimination as source of income, significantly reduces denials for housing with people with housing assistance. This benefits the whole region. Source of income protection ordinances are attractive because they allow families of freedom of opportunity to choose where to live and makes it possible for lower income families to find housing that they can afford in low poverty, resource rich locations like here in Gahanna. It opens up access to additional job opportunities. Rental assistance also is a way to create more housing that's affordable to people. We cannot build our way out of the need for affordable housing. Opening up housing that is market rate to people who have various types of rental assistance is creating affordable housing. And importantly, this creates more inclusive communities. So being a property owner is a business. And businesses comply with many laws and regulations to protect people from discrimination. Source of income ordinances are such a protection. The interference with their business is minimal. And it's important to know that many landlords do accept housing choice vouchers as they see the economic benefit. Are there unintended consequences? We're not aware of any negative unintended consequences from adoption of this type of ordinance. A positive uh, consequence is furthering the Fair Housing Act. But one thing I'll add is that it's important to educate both landlords and tenants after adoption of this type of ordinance. Amy, could I ask you to speak a little bit closer to the microphone oh, or pick yep. it up and hold it? Th oh, thank you. Thank you. Is that better? You might, if you can pick it up, that might be better. 
Okay, is that better? Much better. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, so far, um, 20 states and 121 cities in the District of Columbia have adopted this ordinance. Lori Ann said that um, at the time she started working on it, there's about, what, seven or we so? We became the seventh, as far as I knew. In the yeah. state. And now there are 17 in the state. And after Bexley and the um, other cities here in um, central Ohio adopted, People in Cleveland saw what we were doing and other parts of the state and said that they are following Central Ohio. Nationwide, more than half of the voucher holders are living in cities with source of income protections. HUD found that cities with a source of income protection reduces denial rates for housing dramatically. This also then once this type of protection is um, enacted, it also helps people who have other sources of income besides housing choice vouchers. So this will create more affordable housing and mixed income neighborhoods here in uh, Gahanna. This is how we create diversity and inclusive neighborhoods throughout the region. This will also help standardize and modernize rental practices throughout the region. So on November 16th, there's going to be a program hosted by Building Inclusive Communities called Visualizing Density and Legalizing Housing in Central Ohio. Interested in learning more and attending, it's free, it's on the Move to Prosper website. And once, you know, one step in this process is adopting source of income protection as a way to legalize housing for everybody everywhere. So thank you very much for having us tonight. Um, I just want to let you know that Jerry Valentine with Renter Mentor, who's an expert on um, how the uh, Housing Choice Voucher program works, will be here next week to um, share his thoughts and um, answer any questions. So thank you, and are there any questions? I'd like to thank you very much. Yes, Ms. Angelou. You know, I want to say something here that it was by September 29th, 2021, uh, that at the Columbus Metropolitan Club was building inclusive communities. And indeed, my picture is here with you too. <laughs> and I wanted you to know that. But now I'd like to tell you a little bit about Gehanna, something that you maybe don't know, a vision and mission statement that we've had for many years, although it might be changed a little bit now, but I don't think so. Our Gehanna's vision is to be an innovative model community that values its rich heritage, pursues high standards, and promotes respect among its citizens. And our mission is, Gehanna's mission is to ensure an exceptional quality of life by providing comprehensive services, financial stability, and well-planned development, which preserves the natural environment, in order that the city, that in order that city government can uh, will continue to be responsive, accessible, accountable to our diverse and growing community of citizens, and I'm I'm very proud of this particular vision and mission statement, although it might change to something more, much more, uh, you know, shorter. This tells what we are, and indeed, this tells what some of the people here do. So I just wanted to, to rem I don't know if you remembered me, but I remembered you when I saw this, so I brought this tonight. I do remember you, and we've been emailing, or I've sent you emails over the course right. of a couple of years. And thank you for being at that Building Inclusive Communities program with a national speaker. And everything that Gehanna stands for is what the source of income protection is all about. And so we'd gladly like to see Gehanna be, um, adopt this ordinance and continue living your vision and mission. Having worked in that particular that community, because I work with people with disabilities, I, I understand this, but I just wanted to make sure you understood that uh, I remembered all of you, and Jane, and so Jane Scott is, I'm surprised she isn't here too, so. <laughs> thank, thank you. you for allowing me. Yes, thank you, thank you, Mrs. Angelou. Any other questions? Yes, Mrs. Pado Ms. Padova. 
Not so much a question, just a comment. I went to the last Building Inclusive Communities and it was an excellent session and I um, encourage my colleagues here to try and make the next one and anyone out there as well because it was very informative, so thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Hope you can attend and I think uh, the last one was hosted with the um, City of Worthington. Mm -hmm. City of Bexley has had programs with us and what we're doing is you know, educating the community about this very important need. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you so time. much, Thank Amy you so much for Maureen. having us. We appreciate your time tonight. Any thank other, you for having us. Other, okay, great. <clears throat> All right, the next item on the agenda tonight, and Amy, please take your time. <laughs> we just have a long agenda, so we'll keep moving. Uh, the next item we have tonight is uh, the wrap-up uh, from Director Strum, uh, Economic Development Training Series number five. Is that like Mambo number five? I'm not dancing. <laughs> so I hope no, 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 don't do it. I mean, he can't be the only one who makes jokes, right? <laughs> I mean, for a lawyer, it's a low bar. <laughs> take full responsibility of Kevin's delay in this. Um, I gave him the slide deck a little, little later than I anticipated, so. We good? Oh, I'm sorry. The, the, do we want to? There was one, uh, the video that we wanted to play with. Um, we were not able to include it last time. Could we do that still? So um, last week we had moved to Prosper here, and there was a YouTube video with Bessie. If we can do that super quickly, we can squeeze it in. Sorry, Director Strum. I'm here for the long haul. <laughs> That's what we love about you. I know. had sound earlier today when I was here. You were Tricks, um, just being bullied on by teachers and things like that. I mean family owned property that we have, we did lose our house to a fire prior to joining the program exactly four days to being accepted from the program. So technically we were we were homeless. Failing school districts, um, just being bullied on by teachers and things like that. I mean, my young black sons wouldn't have been as far as they are now. With the confidence that they have, the time that the schools took out to identify issues, they fixed the issues not with, oh, that's a bad kid and labeling, they fixed it more with love. Like, hey, I noticed that this may be a trigger. We're gonna try this instead of send them to the behavioral school. knowing how many others are in the same exact position you are in, praying for a new way, praying for an out, not getting the assistance that they may need. You know, there's that in-between, those in-between folks that are willing, ready to work, not comfortable, and you make $2 too much. You make $5 too much. You know, like, where is this too much coming in from? You know what I mean? So I think it's phenomenal. A year from now, for sure, I will be a CDL uh, driver, um, CDL holder. I've put in place businesses not only for me, but for my children as well. They've came up with the Fidget Lab. So the Fidget Lab is basically gonna be a sensory store where you can buy fidgets, weighted blankets, lava lamps, anything that you find to calm any anxieties. I'm working on building um, their businesses. I did a program through Move to Prosper. Actually, um, I was referred to, it was the Her Way Business Builder program I completed. And I got a lot of great tools on how to build a business. My family's participation in Move to Prosper has changed the trajectory of our lives. We are in a better neighborhood with um, a safer neighborhood. 
a neighborhood with a lot of access to the things that we need. And the school system, um, above all, is the best change for us. It's not one key ingredient, it's the mixture of it all. The coaching, the rental support, you know, the fact that you chose neighborhoods that were more, um, had more opportunities, you know, things like that. It's all of it, it's the perfect recipe. It's just the perfect recipe, but all those components have to, you know, be in to make that recipe work. I prayed for a voice, I got a voice, I got the confidence that I needed just to be myself and just speak freely. For just 67. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Schultz. I wasn't sure where that commercial was going, but I was going to be very interested in what was going to save me in car insurance. Uh, so as I shared with the um, with Chief earlier, uh, this 107 slide final um, will be slipped every every four seconds for the next 30 minutes. I'm very excited to be here. It's not that long, I promise. Um, a little agenda for what we're going to talk about this evening as part of the final session uh, and pulling it all together. So reviewing prior presentations and then how we're putting our thumb on the scale. So what does that mean? How we're dealing with incentives and ROI, how we're targeting industry and clusters, and by happenstance talking a little bit about housing, uh, given the folks here that I think behind me have a significant interest in that conversation as well. <laughs> oh boy. Um, so what have we talked about? So what is economic development? I really hope um, what your position and opinion of what I do has changed from at least from what my family thinks I do to what I think I do or what I actually do, which is lose my mind. I'll be going to a little bit of appreciation over the last five sessions as to what the profession is here um, operationally. We did review some of the tools in the toolbox, so we talked a lot about incentives. We talked a lot about how, what our programs here in Gahanna are, our pre versus post, our various areas. We have one through five. There'll be a final test uh, on the next Committee of the Whole. There'll be an oral test, but I, I won't be presenting. I'll just be giving you questions, and you'll be filling out the Google form. Um, we talked a lot about TIFs and what that looks like and how TIFs are generated, how they're calculated, with how that goes into it operationally. Uh, we talked a lot about our tax rebate program here. So we do have an income tax refund program that we're actually currently revising uh, as part of an analysis in the marketplace. So I'm doing a, a case analysis right now upstairs on what other communities are doing in this space, how they're crediting, how they're making sure they're maximizing the value not only to the business, but also maximizing the return to the community from that investment standpoint, and what those tipping points and thresholds are. Uh, we talked about special units of government, uh, from a CIC uh, to an NCA to SIDS. We had a long discussion on SIDS and ESIDS. Uh, as a reminder on the ESID, we are actually part of the Franklin County City of Columbus ESID. That's actually Black Bexley, Worthington, City of Columbus, Franklin County ESID. Um, and we actually have a project already involved with that, which is the One Church up on North Hamilton. We had one Columbus pop in, so Matt McAllister popped in, talked a lot about what they're doing in the business attraction space, uh, how they're marketing us in the global community and exposing, exposure for opportunities here in Central Ohio. We talked about their active pipeline and what projects they're working on right now in the marketplace. Their successes so far for the year, our successes over the last 18 months, and actually since that presentation about two months ago, uh, that's gone up. So that's a five, that's a 160, that's a 28, and that's a 14 value. So we've gone up significantly, even since uh, six, eight weeks ago. We talked about housing. So this was Carly uh, came in, uh, Director Booz uh, from the Affordable Coalition for Housing in Central Ohio. Uh, she popped in and we talked through a lot of this slide of where the jobs are and, where they're, and what our incomes are happening in the city. Uh, we talked about this slide and what affordability really means in our city. Uh, this, is the, this is the ratios that are used throughout the entire Metroplex area, so we can actually do a dive if we needed to on the city of Gahanna. But when we talk about AMI, um, and we say 80% AMI, it's really $60,000 per person. Um, that's an hourly wage of just under $30 an hour, and those are the jobs that that kind of fits. So this is where it, the rubber meets the road a little bit. When we start talking about what housing means, affordable housing means, I know, I know we had to move to Prosper just here, talking through their programming and, and their vibrancy and the SOI, but this is, this is the soup and nuts of that. This is, this is where the money comes in. 
Um, we talked about median household income sales and the median rental rates and the explosion that's happening right now uh, in that rental marketplace uh, in cost standpoint. We talked about source of income. Uh, it's like we actually coordinated this. We really didn't. Um, we talked about pay to stay a little bit and then some of the legislation that that's sur surfacing around and why that's important uh, to treat rental like home ownership. Uh, in that space so that people have the ability to catch up if they need to, that, that people cannot be discriminated against based upon where their monies are coming from. And I think it's actually an important clarifier. They made a comment earlier on MTP about what those sources could be. And I, I happened to sit in the back of the room and there were some kerfuffles uh, about some of those sources. And, and one of the things that actually, according to the city of Worthington and, and some of those sources, that sources can also be retirement income that those sources can also be 401ks. They can be other federally subsidized wages that you receive at a retirement age that can be discriminated against if they don't want you in, your, in that community. So I, I, this affects not only the folks that they talked about and, and, the, and, and, and parents and, and, and immigrants, but this, is, this affects a lot of our population, quite frankly, in that source, in that source space. And then we had Jeff Harris in the Nate Strum Comedy Show. Uh, just two weeks ago. So this is the measuring success in ROI. How are we garnering, engaging that success? How are we working through that process? Um, talking through the 2.0 analysis and how are we balancing those scales a little bit more rather than going all in on incentives? How are we finding out what that break even point is on the developer side to maximize the return to the communities? Uh, what net present value, sufficient coverage cover? I mean, we could have gone into a lot deeper of a, a slide in there um, on some of those programs. You know, I'll talk about how do you balance TIF just to service that and make sure you're maximizing that resource back as a case study. So what does all this really mean at the end of the day? Um, we've covered a ton of material over these five, five sessions. One of the things that we heard a lot of is, is really this. And I know it's hard for the folks in the back to read. I'm happy to share this slide or this slide deck. Um, but as council, you know my office regularly looks at the numbers. This isn't a WAG. I won't tell you what the WAG is an abbreviation for, but it's not a WAG. Um, we go through the analysis. We work through the parties. We figure out where our payroll projections are. We figure out what the tax implications are. We always take into account what our school compensation agreement is. Um, when Jeff spoke here two weeks ago, he really highlighted the need to partner in that. I think although our, I would argue that our, our agreement is antiquated and old, we're still abiding by that agreement and making sure that our, our fair share is being done to the schools as it relates to some of these incentive arrangements, which is why we always take into account the school compensation as a cost out, so make sure we're always taking that into account when we're doing these projects. Um, but we're also making sure we're, we're antiquating the values here properly. So I know when I first got here, um, Ms. Uh, Councilman Schnetzer and I had a very, very healthy debate about the value of a building uh, and whether a building should be included as part of the ROI calculation or, or why does that matter to the city and to the taxpayers. And although I still contend to this day that there is some intrinsic value to a building, I have removed it from all calculations and the only thing you see are taxable revenues back into the city on those ROI calcs. Is that fair, Councilman? Thank you. Thank you. But that's why this is important. And this is a fluid document. So as other metrics are identified, one of the things I want to really highlight as part of the ROI analysis is that as a government, as a, as a public body, um, it's my responsibility as part of the administration here for Mayor Jawin, as well as your position as elected leaders in our community to tell me where the numbers need to be, to tell me where we want to weight this. Um, I just can't come here tomorrow and be like, willy-nilly, I wish to have all EV manufacturing in Gahanna. We're going to do everything we can to get every EV deal here. Electric vehicles, for those who don't speak in economic development. Um, we want every deal. And then we put our weight, our thumb on the scale. But that has to make sense for all parties. So it's, it's that constant balancing and figuring out how, how do we make those deals make sense. Um, targeting clusters. So actually, this folds in really well to my EV comment. Um, we see the fields that one of Columbus is currently targeting into. So you talk about your biologics and, and, and cell and gene therapy, your electronic and hydrogen vehicle processing, your semiconductors, and your, and your fintech businesses. What are we doing? 
we're amplifying that. So we actually expand that even farther and as our targeted clusters include medical, general industrial manufacturing, uh, and quite frankly, the biggest thing that we can be doing in our local community is building out a robust business retention and expansion program. Working with our existing businesses more so than anything else. What you really heard from Matt when he spoke from a One Columbus perspective is, is their work in the space around attraction. And if you talk to any other economic development professional in this country, they would tell you between 60 and 70% of your projects are not new, are not attraction based. They're retention based. They're going into the buildings and going to your existing businesses and helping them understand workforce drivers, capital expenditure needs, um, transportation and infrastructure improvements that support organic natural growth in your community versus always trying to chase that new big shiny. Um, the reality is though, in Columbus right now, we're big, we're new and we're shiny and we've got a lot of eyes on us and so we're seeing a significant amount of, of what I would say where it's going to be 60-40 or 70-30, it's probably 40-60 the other way. We're seeing um, a lot more in the attraction space versus the retention space right now. Our existing businesses are a little nervous about workforce. We're constantly meeting with them and talking to them about what that programming looks like and how we can help support them as they're looking to do what's called incumbent training, which is taking that existing worker and elevating them in that workplace. Um, but we're having those ongoing conversations. But that's our biggest tool that we can be doing, and we're, we're building out that regularly. I like a good march. That's, that's odd. Yeah, we could go. And then housing. This is putting our scale, our thumb on the scale. And I, and I actually didn't include this as part of the initial summarization because I think there are two points in here that I absolutely, positively, without a doubt, did not want to gloss over. And that's point two and point five. Franklin County should be building 14,000 plus homes per year. We are building 11, less than 11. What is that doing? That's taking the existing housing stock that we have, whether that's single family or multifamily housing, and making them astronomically expensive. It's the depth of the resource and the compounding interest in the market that is creating a, not only a housing shortage, but an unsustainable housing cost shortfall in the marketplace. Because we are year over year missing between three and 4,000 new housing uh, to support population growth here in the marketplace. The other one is, it's gonna get worse. Item five, Intel is going to bring 20,000 plus new jobs to the region. So when we already have a shortfall between three and 4,000 homes a year in the net new construction, and we're gonna add 20,000 new homes, or 20,000 new jobs, which on average brings 1.25 people per job, and that's just Intel. That doesn't account for all the suppliers. That doesn't account for all the other opportunities that are coming to the marketplace or our natural growth projection. So I want to make sure that was fully articulated here, that I think it's really important for us. And again, not knowing what's happening behind me this evening, uh, to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation around the need for housing. Because if we don't, these numbers are going to get significantly worse, not only for Central Ohio, but also um, in our city. My wife and I have no children. We have a dog. We do not fit in a traditional bucket when it comes to buying homes. We have a lot of flexibility. And although my, my realtor is in the office or in the house tonight, she can attest, I couldn't find a home in Gahanna to save my life. I had every intention to live in our community. But with dual income, no children, minimal school debt, I could not afford to buy a home in Gahanna this summer. 